Okay, so, well, it's really lovely to be here, and I've, uh, <clears throat> I've really enjoyed all the papers so far, so my thanks to everyone who's presented, but also maybe especially to Sylvia and her colleagues for organising the event. It's been really interesting so far. So far. <laughs> what you can see on screen is a photograph of a real postcard sent by the American artist Carl Andre to one of my two regular collaborators, the English artist Simon Morris. With it, Andre is forbidding Simon from reproducing his three-vector model diagram in an exhibition about reading methodologies because, as the postcard's opening sentence says, Andre believes that, open quote, the desire to read the work of art is the annihilation of the possibility of reading that work of art, close quote. Simon Morris, myself, and the American literary theorist Craig Dworkin together co-edit a publishing collective called Information as Material, which Simon started by accident in York, England in 2002, and Craig and I joined remotely around 2006. Last summer, there was a small survey exhibition of some recent projects by Information as Material at the Northern Gallery of Contemporary Art in England. And we used this photograph of Andre's postcard as the front face of the exhibition invite. So this is the back of the same invitation card. To Andre's declaration against the very possibility of an art of reading, open quote, we say, whatever, Carl, perhaps you should learn to read differently, close quote. The exhibition's title, Learn to Read Differently, is a call to work that in many ways expresses what the three of us do under the collective name Information as Material and why we do it. This overexposed photograph is an install shot of an eponymous work produced for that show. It's an assisted ready-made, based on a John Baldessari poster work called Learn to Read, which was freely distributed by the Tate some years ago. We matched the print's typography in yellow vinyl letters, took the glass off this framed copy, and stuck the D-I-F-F on the print, the E-R-E -E on the window mount, the N on the frame, and the T-L-Y on the gallery wall. Information as material functions like an umbrella, under which we try to keep open a space for a peculiar kind of conceptualist writing to be self-published. It's a self-publishing vehicle with which we support ourselves and other authors to take responsibility for the full object status of the written text as a reproduced cultural object. The authors we support write books, not just texts. Everything about their composition, reproduction and circulation is subject to or open to authorial decisions. That, really, is why our books are artist books. What we publish is cohered by the overlapping interests that Simon, Craig and I have in cultures of administration, in the imposition of scientific and aesthetic hierarchies upon language, in the possibilities of heterological and heteroglossic collaboration, in the ever-accelerating floods of textual overproduction in an always-already digital age, in the sight and performance of writing, in the subjectivation of readers, and in the kinds of writing that happen on the outside of literature and other disciplines of knowledge from inside contemporary art. The imprint works to unfold some of the historical and ethical lessons of DIY culture through what Kenneth Goldsmith calls the practice of publishing, such that Simon, Craig and I have worked collaboratively towards an understanding of publishing as praxis. These interests, now listed on screen, overlap with one another in strange ways, and at those points of overlap, they create seams or folds in the circulation of language. In those folds, unusual forms of language can come to the surface. Each of these unusual forms is formed in and by the specificities of its seam. And for us, publishing is the performance of drawing those language formations out and making them public in whatever way might allow other people to read them interestingly to read them differently than one would if that formation of language had stayed just in the scene. Co-working toward this performance is our praxis of publishing, and we do it by using the author function of the quasi-institution information as material as an umbrella. For me, it's important to remember that the word publish derives from the Latin publicare, to, to make public, via the Middle English publicen, to, to get rid of, to let go of. <clears throat> It's in this complicated double sense that Information as Material has published over 40 books, chapbooks and pocketbooks, edition fine and mass prints, made documentary films and web works, and produced exhibitions either by curating thematic group shows or by the three of us making artworks under the name IAM. I am. 
It's also with this complicated double sense in mind that I want to point toward four things this evening. Firstly, how we might distinguish certain kinds of self-publishing by the way in which they problematize the subject status of the self at work. Secondly, how the digital mediatization of writing technologies outside the context of art is casting some kind of technical foreshadow in front of new writing generally. Thirdly, what might be interesting about recontextualizing our experiences of mediatized media as art, if you like, what might be aesthetically possible in that foreshadow. And fourthly, the importance of comparativist histories to thinking critically about self-publishing as a mode of collaborative action with which people can work open imaginative problems. I'm going to introduce each of these four points with an example. Each of these examples is just that, one possible example, which I've chosen because I know it, not necessarily because I think it exemplary in any singular sense. This is the cover of the first. It's called Of the Subcontract, and I self-published it through Information as Material last summer. On screen, you can see the book's cover spread, which was actually printed on a mirrorboard stock and looked like this. Every copy looks like an external hard drive or a piece of IKEA bathroom furniture. Whoever picks up a copy sees themselves reflected in the image of the cloud, hence the sparse typography. The design is a very heavy-handed way of saying that this is a book about the cloud and the network in their web-mediated senses, and about the weird ways that we're all increasingly interpolated by the networked cloud. The idea for the book came about years ago when I stumbled upon the beta version of this online labour pooling service run by Amazon.com. E-labour pools are a burgeoning new industry. They refine the practices of outsourcing and subcontracting so beloved of high capitalism through online-only management interfaces. Here's a screen capture of that interface. <clears throat> Basically, businesses can register with the website as requesters and offer set amounts of money for the completion of data sorting jobs that can't yet quite be done by a computer, like tagging names of celebrities in photographs or checking for typos in transcripts of speech. Individuals can register as workers and can accept or decline the jobs and wages that requesters offer. All participants have to deal with their own tax liability. And because the whole system is database driven, both requesters and workers can have total anonymity behind their avatar IDs. This image is the control panel of my requester account. And it shows just a glimpse of the amazing range of performance metrics that the system automatically produces for every job as it's getting done. Here's a small sample of the website's graphics. The diagram at the bottom shows the fantasy of the workflow. The strap line under the logo in the top right corner describes the fantasy of the system. It wants to interpolate human workers as a resource of artificial, artificial intelligence. Mechanical Turk's graphic register is a great example of what I've been calling the emerging iconography of cloud living and computational capitalism. These web graphics on screen are all from the site. They each function as a sign and a button and are developed from the desktop icons on your own computer. Like those icons, the name of the service is based on a string of blunt metaphors. The Mechanical Turk was the colloquial name given to a machine made in the mid-18th century by an Austro-Hungarian inventor called Wolfgang von Kempelin. It became famous because it appeared to be a functioning automaton that could play match-winning games of chess. The exterior of the machine looked a lot like this sketch, a floor-standing cabinet with a wooden figure sat behind in Orientalist dress. What's really amazing about this invention is that it was actually a fake automaton. Over the years, different accomplished chess players, who were also dwarfs, were paid to sit in a hidden tray in the bottom of the cabinet. They would pull levers to move the pieces on the board above. It was artificial, artificial intelligence. And the infamy it bought von Kemplin has obscured the historical reception of his other innovations, which include the first ever working voice synthesizer built from bellows, leather straps, tuning screws, and a mouth-like horn of India rubber. All of these cross-references were poured into my book, which takes the form of a conventional collection of 100 poems. 
you can see the full title page on the left and the contents page on the right. All 100 of those poems were written for me by workers on the Mechanical Turk service, where they get called Turks. The, sim the sample page you can see on the right is the first poem. The three-digit number, 0 0.01, below the poem's title, is the amount I paid in US dollars for the poem. The trio of metadata below the poem's title serves the page layout in lieu of typographic embellishments. The trio quantifies the time taken by the worker to complete the job, the effective hourly rate they therefore earned, and the number of poems that worker has in this book. That layout illustrates the style sheet for the whole book. The poems in the collection are arranged from one cent to one dollar according to cost of production rather than, say, expressive theme. I had all of the icons digitally redrawn as vector graphics so that each of the four sections in the book has a title and graphic epigraph appropriated directly from Amazon. With this strange example in mind, I want to make my first point. <clears throat> Self-publishing is conventionally assumed to be a last resort. Maybe the work isn't good enough to interest someone else in publishing it, or the author doesn't understand how the publishing industry is meant to work. All such reasons are considered to signify a failure on the author's part, a failure to get properly published. This interpretation complains that self-publishing is a misuse of access to the means of reproduction, and it mistakenly presumes that all self-publishing just reproduces a self that has already been stably produced. It's an interpretation based on the industrial logic of manufacturing. A composition is finalised, like a manuscript, then reproduced in units by binding and printing. Or a self is finalised, then reproduced like a unit. In either example, the creative work is finished before reproduction starts, because the system of reproduction needs a stable unit. This kind of self-publishing has an archetype, the vanity press, against which I think we can deduce a different kind of self-publishing, more like a publishing self. <clears throat> Vanity presses mimic the structures and behaviours of those presses on the inside of the mainstream of the publishing industry. <clears throat> those, uh, those presses, those that obey a manufacturing flow of production, then reproduction. And they do so, so as to centre the ego whose vanity is to be impressed, impressed upon us, the public, and back upon itself, the vain self. Although one ego might control the means and agenda of production at a vanity press, being vain in no way demands that the subject of that ego does the work him or herself, nor that they take responsibility for the work. Quite precisely, vanity publishing is vain. It relies on affirmation and risk aversion, and consequently will always favour controlled representations. And what the vain model can only ever obscure is that all publishing projects always involve a multitude of selves through multiple processes, multiple ingredients, multiple institutions, and multiple people. At Information as Material, we're interested in how performances of making language public can conceptually extend, or even hyperextend, the changeable selves, plural, who might choreograph an act of publishing. We're interested in reproducing cultural objects that privilege language, like books, as if they were insufficient representations that invite readers to engage critically with their insufficiency. At Information as Material, we produce our publications with the forethought that the thing we're composing will be reproduced in a certain form. Those multiplied forms of the cultural object are the work, the thing to be experienced and read, not tail-end designs that transferable content get pours in, gets poured into. Our aim is to open up the self-publishing self to be challenged and mediated by the process of their writerly act becoming public as a reproduced cultural object. I wonder if we can think about this as a productive negation of the logic of reproduction that depends on production then reproduction. In its place, a new logic might instead be better phrased as reproduction as production, in the sense that the work only becomes whatever it is in its being multiplied and circulated. By this model, self-publishing would multiply the self, reproduce the self as an act of production, and in many ways put the self at stake through the process of writing reproducible objects, objects that only work as insufficient representations of the self publishing themselves. 
Over Easter, I was responding to some interview questions about of the subcontract, and I stumbled back upon this comment from Jean-Luc Nancy, first published in French in 1996, but actually written in 1995. That the mediatization of media seemed more paramount an issue than the question of being 20 years ago to someone who wasn't a philosopher of media is, I think, a telling sign. Since then, digital hardware software combinations have standardized desktop publishing, seemingly naturalized the database as an organizing principle for life, and now aggregate flows of data in constant streams around the world in volumes way beyond the limits of what anyone can actually read. Every time we type on a computational device, our keystrokes are being published by default, to some degree of discretion, every few seconds. They're saved automatically into the file you're making, onto the archive drive of your device, onto the linked backup servers your workplace has installed, and evidently onto the monitored databases of international surveillance groups. That's an addition of four before you've even finished a sentence. With this kind of immediate and invisible reproduction, <clears throat> sorry, what this kind of immediate and invisible reproduction demonstrates is that often now, writing and publishing are the same action, that self-publishing is something we do to ourselves by default. Services like Mechanical Turk might be driven by new technology, but the demand they supply is rarely new. Ghostwriting, for example, is at least as old as the scriptures. That, online marketplace, that an online marketplace and the transferable materiality of text as data can reduce the lag in connecting clients and providers just improves an old model. But it also further conceals the use of such cognitive labour services in fields like academia, where we have no real idea how many students now use untraceable dissertation writing services like this. And so to my second point. I think that the digital mediatization of the media of writing, both the language itself and our technologies of inscription and dissemination, is casting some kind of technical shadow in front of new writing practices. This shadow abstracts the authorial self even further. And as a foreshadow, or a shadow in front, it can help us to at least look toward an outline of how digital network technologies might prove to be antecedents for the new kinds of language formations we can make public as art. This article for the LA Times was a watershed, not because it was written entirely by a computer algorithm, but because the penultimate sentence openly admits so. Open quote, this information comes from the UGSG Earthquake Notification Service, and this post was created by an algorithm written by the author. Close quote. Here, the author is not claiming to have composed the sequence of words, or even to have sourced and analysed the data. Ken Schwenk's authorial claim is to have written the algorithm that did the work, to have mediatised the medium of public language, and to have sold its output. Algorithms like Schwenk's compose texts using a method called narrative analytics, which is perfectly suited to data-led fields of knowledge, like science, and epitomised by programmes like this one, called narrative science. Couched in the same iconographic register of cloud living we saw earlier, this diagram on, sc on screen shows the workflow model of the narrative science service. It promises that its downloadable algorithm will analyze a data set, transform that data into a narrative text, and crucially, compose precise, clear insights. Until now, the latter at least, the production of new insights, had been assumed to be the preserve of human authorial subjects. It is, for example, at the core of the social contract that research universities hold with the rest of society when they promise to use public money to produce new knowledge. Narrative science is a simple system compared to something like Longtail. Longtail was programmed by this man, Philip M. Parker, professor of management science at a transnational business school called INSEAD. <clears throat> Parker's authorial output via devices like Longtail is beyond prolific. The, quant the quantified data in the screen capture from Amazon's book listings show in the top left corner that he is the author of over 106,000 books. <laughs> E-book editions are available immediately and print on demand means that there are no surplus stock issues of paperback or hardback copies. Even more impressively, Parker's company, Icon Group International, has published over 550,000 automated books, as you can see in the top left of this listing. 
Schwenk, Narrative Science, Parker, Longtail, and the Icon Group cluster a tiny and overt sample of what I'm calling a technical foreshadow, being cast outside of art, over and in front of all new writing that engages with contemporary media of publishing. Where and what the self is in these complicated systems of making language public are unclear. And they're unclear in a way that poses different questions to our ideas about selfhood than those framed by high modern literary debates about neuters, life writing, committed literature, or the turn to disjunction. But how an authorial self can work in this shadow may well be a more relevant question to our conference today. The question of how certainly introduces my third point. For some of the writers that information as material supports, including this guy, Kenneth Goldsmith, a move away from something like the working book toward working databases completes a move or step backwards from the published codex toward documenting the flows of language in a network, new networks, new networks that are fundamentally database driven. What you can see Kenneth sitting amongst is an installation at Labour Gallery in New Mexico, or sorry, Mexico City commissioned last summer and entitled Printing Out the Internet. Whole areas of the gallery look like this, piled high with printouts. The piece was made by inviting people anywhere in the world to print out sections of the internet and post them to the gallery. During two months on show, with an additional two month lead in, over 20,000 bundles of material were sent in an act of crowdsourcing. The project was dedicated to Aaron Schwartz, Schwartz committed suicide in January last year on the verge of being sentenced to 35 years in prison plus a $1 million fine for downloading lots of academic journal articles via the JSTOR distribution gate. JSTOR is a transnational commercial distribution firewall that sells licenses to its database of academic journal articles on behalf of their publishers. The inspiration of Schwartz's activism and the material premise of making databases actually present were refined by Goldsmith in this new installation, a work called Papers from the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. It was commissioned for an exhibition called Smart New World, currently on show at the Kunsthalle Dusseldorf. What you can see are day and night shots of a temporary working office, set up in the gallery and staffed by volunteers from the local art academy, who serve as invigilators, librarians and data processors. They're collectively mining a 33 gigabyte torrent of over 18,000 journal articles downloaded from JSTOR and uploaded to Pirate Bay by a guy called Greg Maxwell soon after Schwartz was first charged. Maxwell's torrent came with a long statement about why he was recirculating these articles from the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, which he had legally downloaded as a registered user of JSTOR, but was breaking his contract of use by freely sharing. In Goldsmith's installation, the files are downloaded and printed live. They're stacked up as a growing archive on the public reading tables in front of the office desks. This whole, very material operation, being staged publicly as art, brings to the surface something that is still just a few clicks away. Maxwell's torrent is still available as immaterial data if anyone wants it. Nominating this archive as art, and making a processual performance of having data slaves extract its content like miners in a delegated performance implicates or subsumes a chain of acts of self-publishing. Yet the work simultaneously brings all of those acts of self-publishing under a macro-institutional framework and the function of one author's name. Where, what and how these selves are at work in making this language public, public again but differently, is complicated and computationally driven. But the way it makes institutions and productive processes intersect or co-work reminds me of the importance of looking backwards for precedence as much as looking forwards for folds in the shadow. In my experience, often what appear as shiny new digital questions about modes and flows of self-publishing actually have clear precedence inside and outside of print history that demonstrate amazing ingenuity and energy and deserve to be attended to historico-theoretically. My concluding example tried to do exactly that. This is a photo of a commissioned installation made by Simon, Craig and I for the Whitechapel Gallery in 2012. It was called Do or DIY and you're looking at the title wall. 
The installation filled two adjoining rooms and had four components. Firstly, typeset in vinyl lettering around all eight walls is a short, two-part polemical essay about the concealed history of self-publishing by authors who went on to be canonized in Western literary history, history, from Marcel Proust to Derek Walcott. The first, longer part of the essay is made up of anecdotes about uh, exactly such events. The second, shorter part of the essay builds on those anecdotal examples and makes a rallying call to the reader to self-publish, to do it yourself. Secondly, in three cabinets standing amongst the two rooms were examples like this, of self-published first editions of books referred to in the essay, as well as two stories by Virginia Woolf. There were first edition copies of Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, John Ruskin's first book of poems, and six or seven other things, ranging up to a review copy of Kathy Acker's Great Expectations. The two galleries that the installation occupied were previously reading rooms in the old Whitechapel Public Library, which the gallery had extended into in 2009. The third component of our installation reinstated that function. It was signalled by this light box, which used to hang above the entranceway of the library on the high street outside, and which we found on top of an office cupboard. Running around the rim of the two rooms was a free-to-handle reference library of mass-reproduced copies of all the books referred to in the anecdotes of our essay. The fourth component was stacked on, a, on top of an old oak reading table, which had been salvaged from the library, stored in the gallery's basement, and which we returned to its old position. On the table were free-to-take copies of a pocketbook version of the essay, the same essay that circled around the room. Here's the cover spread for the pocketbook. It contained just the essay, which the three of us originally wrote in, as the foreword for the London Art Book Fair catalogue in 2011. At a conference in Paris that summer, in 2012, a Chilean poet called Carlos Soto Román asked me if he could translate Do or DIY into Spanish. We thought that it would be a great idea if, as well as translating the existing English manuscript, he added more examples from his native literary history to the anecdotal first section of our essay. Oh, sorry. Here you can see the cover of the Spanish edition, published by Das Capital Books in Santiago. Our collaboration with Carlos set a precedent which has given the project a second life. The book has since been translated into German, Italian and French, and we've had inquiries about Dutch and Russian versions too. Every translation follows the same method. The translator translates the current master manuscript and adds examples of self-publishing by authors who came to be canonized in their native literary history. You can see on this German cover that Carlos is now listed as an author, and so too is Annette Gilbert, who prepared this edition for Salon Verlag in Cologne. Each translator becomes a co-author of a manuscript that snowballs with every new version. And the publication of every new version brings one more new independent publisher into a growing network. In a very modest, analogue way, this project tries to invite those involved to let go of the unity of a vain self by opening up a public co-self, or selves, through writing. On screen are some shorthand references for anyone who's interested in following up on the kinds of things I've been talking about this evening. What I hope my final example shows is the importance of events like today, where people gather from different backgrounds to think comparatively about the critical potential of artists m to make different things public and to allow people to read those things differently. The general idea of the book as a site of work, a workbook, a document and a prompt, has a long didactic history in the genre of textbooks. But artists' workbooks, or working books, or book works, engage their makers and readers in a different kind of work. In the context of art, work always refers to a thing and an action through the form of a thing done or a thing being done. And I think that any critical praxis of self-publishing, which makes language public through books or installations or whatever else, demands that those involved be willing and able to work like art work. Thank you. <laughs>